So first, I haven't had to do this in many years, so if I seem a little nervous, I apologize. Um, so my name is Jeff Lahm with Ventana Microsystems. I'm here to talk about uh, RISC-V features and optimizations that are dropping into GCC 14. Um, let me try to keep my clicker with me. Um, so I've been doing GCC work for uh, over 30 years professionally, so I, I know this compiler, I know the community, um, but this represents the work from many organizations. Um, this is not just me, it's not just the team at Ventana, it's a multinational, multi-organizational effort. Um, we'll talk about improvements that are, that are dropping for GCC 14. Uh, these are things that are landing essentially right now. We'll talk very briefly about stuff that will happen beyond that. Um, maybe a couple of challenges. I think we're probably going to be running short of time. But you know, if, if we have time, we'll talk about challenges. And if you have questions, um, we can try to do them integrated. Um, questions often help me figure out what level to talk to. So if you've got a question, don't hesitate to let me, to interrupt me and tell me you've got a question. <clears throat> So you'll notice I got some of these uh, highlighted. These are things we are just not gonna have time to do. So um, if you wanna talk about more about this, you know, you can certainly come find me at the Ventana booth after, after the talk. So um, auto vectorization. So when we uh, started GCC 14 development, uh, particularly in looking at from the RISE standpoint, because I'm also leading the, the tool chain effort in the RISE space, um, the one thing that I think every RISE member came to us and said, we've got to have auto vectorization. And so that clearly was you know, the leading feature we're trying to get ready for GCC 14. And so our, our basic goal is, let's try to make sure we can support vectorization uh, in a way that is comparable to what you see on AR64. Um, so a vector length agnostic approach. Um, we're gonna focus on ELMO uh, less than or equal to one just because that is a much better understood space. And conceptually, if it, if it vectorizes on AR64 using uh, vector length agnostic approaches, it should vectorize on RISC-V, that's the goal. And uh, I, I can very happily report that we actually have already met that goal. Um, those bits are already in GCC 14. Um, conceptually, you know, we, we are pretty confident you're gonna be able to see about a two, uh, a factor of two improvement for X264, maybe 10 to 20% on uh, the, the Zalin benchmark from uh, spec 2017. Um, we haven't really done a whole lot on, on FP yet, but I fully expect that we'll see comparable improvements in the FP space. There's still a lot of work to do here. Um, so we have not looked at all at cost modeling. And, and the reason for that is from a feature-free standpoint, um, code that uh, changes generic parts of the vectorizer has to land now. Um, whereas code that just changes cost model because that's target dependent, I can let the developers do that post code freeze. So that's why we got this really hard split between get the generic pieces, the generic infrastructure in place versus the target specific uh, uh, cost modeling. So just as a, I'd actually have the actual loop. All right, so here is uh, the, the SAD loop, uh, 16 by 16 from uh, X264 in the spec benchmark. The, really the key thing to note here is uh, there's an absolute value of the uh, difference of these two pixels. What this looks like vectorized with RVV, um, and there's the, the actual command line I used up there, is the inner loop has been completely vectorized, um, leaving just the outer, just the outer loop. Um, we're operating on 128 bits at a time, which is 16 elements. Um, this is reasonable, but it's not great. Um, really what you'd wanna do if you have a, a larger vector unit, say a 512 bit vector unit, is you wanna take this outer loop and unroll it, uh, I think four more times. So, so there is still a lot we can do here, but even just vectorizing this in the way I just showed up here, that's gonna get, cons if we do this consistently across the benchmark, it's about a factor of two. Um, my, my suspicion is if we, if we can unroll that outer loop, which would be kind of a next year project, um, there's probably another factor or two in there. Um, other things in X264, um, this is scalar side. Um, when we were looking at the scalar code, um, one of the things we saw fairly early was um, we actually don't expose a, an absolute, or sorry, a, a maximum instruction for RV64. So if you're trying to synthesize an absolute value, um, the best synthesis is a max but we didn't expose it. So instead we use this ugly little expression down there, but it's not, it's not terrible, it's, it's a branchless sequence, but you know, if you can expose a 32-bit max, you can eliminate 80 billion instructions out of that benchmark. It's almost four and a half percent of the entire benchmark is just this maxim, maximum, uh, or sorry, absolute value expansion. Um, so again, just one instruction, 80 billion times. The second thing we found on the scalar side, so actually I'm going to back up to the actual loop. So the loop optimizer will look at that inner loop and say, 
if I'm doing scalar, I really just want to unroll that inner loop. So we've got two loads, picks one and picks two. We unroll it 16 times. That's 32 objects I have to keep live all at once. Now, GCC, when it schedules that code, is what we call a, um, code pa or a critical path scheduler. At every cycle in that inner loop, the most important instruction, if you have any left, is a load. You've got to get the loads issued. So if you have, so for example, a four-wide uh, load architecture, you can issue four loads per cycle, but you have 32 of these things to get flying. So the first eight cycles of the loop, all you're doing is issuing loads. And what happens? You blow out the register file. And so you end up doing spilling, which is terrible for performance. Um, and thankfully, there is a way to tell the scheduler, hey, please pay attention to the register pressure. And if it starts to get high, take a load to use stall if that allows you to bring the register pressure down. Um, fixing that was about another 37 billion instructions, all memory references. The combination of the, of the absolute value and, and fixing the spilling was about a 13% improvement in actual runtime for the benchmark. The next space that, that people were really asking a lot about, and, and since I joined the, the, this effort about a year ago, was uh, extensions. Um, that there's a sense that the RISC-V architecture, the way we compile for it, we have way too many zero and sign extensions. Sure enough, we start digging into it, and, and that's exactly, we, we, we find that to be true. Um, the first problem was uh, for GCC, um, if you have a 32-bit instruction like an add W or a sub W, that logically, or, or you can think of as generating two outputs. One is a pure 32-bit output, one is the sign extension of that 32-bit output. So by fully exposing what the hardware actually does to the compiler, we're able to eliminate about 2% of the dynamic instructions from, from XZ, um, roughly the same amount in Leela, and, and about half a percent in several other benchmarks, just by eliminating useless sign extensions. And again, this, this is an example generated by one of my, one of my engineers, but it, it's one instruction, but it is a significant amount of the, of the uh, code space. But, you know, as, as we look, we, we continue to find more of these problems. So we were looking at a, uh, a case where we found a redundant sign extension, and we, 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 what we realized was there is state that GCC keeps, and it was losing track of the fact that a particular value had already been extended. Um, and we traced this back to code from 1994. Um, and if, if you've ever done GCC work, in 1994 there was no public mailing list, there was no test suite, um, you didn't have to justify your patches. People just blew in the patch whenever they felt it was time. Um, and so we couldn't figure out why that code existed. We got to the conclusion it was a bug fix, but there's no test case. I don't know what target it was for. Um, after a ton of evaluation, a ton of, of reviewing code from 1994 forward, we came to the conclusion that the bug it was fixing had been fixed elsewhere. And as a result, we can remove this one little chunk of code, which causes us to lose our sign extension state. And it's about another uh, three quarters of a percent on Omni TPP, about another quarter percent on X264 and, and GCC as well. Um, and it turns out this is a prerequisite for other improvements that we want to be making. Um, and here's actually the example that we were actually working from. This is from the GCC test suite, not an actual benchmark. Again, we've only eliminated this one uh, um, extension in here, right there at the top but uh, it, it turn, does turn out to be significant. The next space, and, the, and I came, when I came into this, this was already underway, and that is address rewriting. GCC has this really kind of an oddball concept where a fr uh, an address in the frame starts as a, off as a frame plus offset, and then late in the compilation, it turns into SP plus a different offset. In the RISC-V world, that offset, if it gets big, it, you have to expand it to multiple instructions. The expansion into multiple instructions spoiled the, the late phase uh, optimizer's ability to take those two offsets and combine them into a single offset. Um, as a result, uh, you end up with, with some truly horrific code. Did I include it here? Yes. So this, again, not the benchmark. This is something we pulled out of the test suite. But you can see it, it's, that's you know, two or three instructions. And we're all, all we're trying to do is compute like you know, SP plus you know, some big number. Um, it's actually fairly significant. And so it turned out, you know, fixing this is only like one line of code, but you got to go find the SOB to get it fixed. Um, and, and, what we, and what we found is this uh, improves deep Shang by about 1%. And, and you're hearing, you know, 1%, 2%. Um, from, a, from a compiler writer standpoint, the consistently over a one-year period, you should expect about 1% from your compiler. That's what it gives you, 1%. So if we're finding 1% here, 1% there, that is right in the, the realm of what we're looking for. 
Um, even with that previous fix, we were still finding cases where that strange FP to SP translation um, was creating uh, redundant code. Uh, MCF gets about 1% from this. Um, in here, you can see that we have this add I of 16 to SP. That should be pushed down into uh, that store instruction. And you can see that on the right-hand side where we've changed the negative eight to positive eight and removed the add I. This is about 1% for MCF. Z-icon, um, so Z-icon's an extension that got ratified earlier this year. Um, it's really, a, you can think of it as conditional zero. And you can use that to, to uh, speed up existing uh, 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 branchless sequences and also to eliminate branches in your code. So this is um, a piece of the CRC loop from CoreMark. Um, it's really, all, all I've extracted here is just the, uh, the conditional XOR. Um, the the, the left-hand side shows what we were doing before. It's a branchless sequence. But with the C0 extension, you can squish one instruction out of there, and it's, it's worth a couple of percent on the actual benchmark itself in terms of real performance. Doesn't look like much, but again, these things add up. Oh, go backwards. Um, I, didn't put it, I didn't put a slide for it, but um, Leela from the SPEC 2017 benchmark suite, um, it has a conditional shift by six. Over a quarter of the entire runtime is branch mispredicts for that conditional shift by six. So if you fail to if convert it, your performance, your performance suffers. The reason I know this is because when we were fixing the if converter, we lost it. <laughs> and as a result, our performance went bad and people got on my case and said, what happened, Jeff? Um, so, so we continue to improve this. So we, we've got really kind of the back end work done. There is a whole set of patches that we're working on in the, in the middle end to, uh, to use it even more. Looking forward to 2024, um, auto vectorization will, will continue to be a, a, a focus ever, particularly around cost modeling, making sure that when we vectorize, it's actually profitable. Um, and, and if there are cases where it should be profitable and we're not computing the cost properly, let's make sure we get the cost modeling fixed. Um, we want to implement function multi-versioning. So function multi-versioning allows you as a developer to say, I've got a function, I want to compile it for um, say uh, RV64GC, I want a separate version for RV64GCV. Um, and by using this attribute, it will create two copies of your function, compiled two different ways, and then it will stick a resolver in front that will look at your uh, processor capabilities in runtime. The first time that function is called, it will say, oh, you have vector, go to the vector version. So that's something we, we are expecting to land. Um, generic improvements to the if conversion pass that I just mentioned. Um, unaligned and overlapping uh, memcopy and memsets. So the traditional way memcopy and memset have been implemented through the years is you have a series of branches at the top that are poorly predicted to deal with alignment and size issues. Then you have another series of branches at the bottom to deal with your residuals. Um, modern architectures don't take anywhere near the performance penalty. So it is advantageous to just say, who cares about alignment? Just go ahead and, just go ahead and, and take the misaligned penalties. It's only one cycle. Um, and you typically end up doing better by avoiding those, those misprediction penalties. Um, more redundant extension removal. This is an area I actually think we'll, we'll probably work on this for at least another year. I, I suspect there's another 1% across the entire spec 2017 suite. Optimization of CRC loops. Um, so if, if you have looked at CoreMark, it's got a CRC loop that is part of the time, part of the benchmark. Um, and it's a bitwise CRC implementation. It's not anything smart like a table lookup. Um, we've got a, an end-to-end -end, uh, pass which will recognize a CRC loop, validate it as a CRC loop using a, a linear feedback shift register validation, extract the polynomial, and then allow you to generate either a table lookup or a CLMOL-based implementation. If you have a CLMOL that's roughly four cycles of latency, so comparable to memory, those two are basically the same in terms of, of performance, CLMOL versus, versus memory. Um, the nice thing about CLMOL is because it is a multiply, but it's simpler, you, hardware guys can actually implement faster than the, the four cycles that, that we're currently seeing. Um, so going to CLMOL will, will significantly improve uh, core mark. We're seeing 10 to 20% in that space. Um, instruction fusion, so RISC V really depends very heavily on instruction fusion to improve performance. Um, we've got code which um, generically tries to express what instructions can be fused so that the compiler can keep them together so that the processor can actually fuse them when it actually starts executing them. And then more just generation improvements. The funny thing about this last topic is I think the last issue there we determined was not feasible as of uh, Friday. Um, just a few challenges if I still got time. Not sure where I am. I can't even read it. Four, four or five minutes, okay, good. 
NAB, so NAB is one of the SPEC 2017 FP benchmarks. Um, it is notoriously hard to vectorize, even if you have a nice set of mass registers. It is, it is dreadful. I've seen code to, to vectorize it on LLVM, but I don't think it ever went production. Um, so it doesn't look like you can do anything. Well, it turns out there is. There is a hot path in that code where it needs the square root of X and the inverse of the square root of X. Right now, those are probably the two most expensive operations you can do on a floating point value, and they're data dependent. So you have to do one, wait for it to finish because they can't be pipelined, and then you actually get the other. This could easily be 60 to 100 cycles, depending on your, on your microarchitecture. Um, it turns out there is a sequence, if you've got a good estimator, that you can get both of those at the same cost, and, and roughly 30 to 40 cycles, depending on how good your, your uh, FMAX are. So that's something that, that I would like to do uh, sometime in the relatively near future. The, the problem we have is we don't have a reciprocal square root estimator for scalar FP. We have it vector, but not scalar. If I have to do it on the vector side, I'll do it there. Uh, Bitmanip. So the bit, Bitmanip extensions have the capability of doing um, variable bit, set, clear, and, and uh, invert, um, which is great. Uh, the problem is, because of the way the, the RISC-V uh, architecture works, is if that variable bit manipulation hits the 32-bit sign bit, I have to extend it. And right now, that makes, that makes this particular extension very difficult to use in C code because C code uses ints. So they want to use a 32-bit object, and I have to sign extend it. Um, the thinking here is I've got to solve the sign extension, redundant sign extension problem first, then I can come back and install and uh, make better use of the bitmap. Um, ZFA. Um, ZFA is a neat little extension in that you can load up um, a set of 32 uh, predefined floating point values. It loads them into a, into a floating point register. That's fine and good. It saves you uh, two or three instructions, saves you a memory reference. But what's the first thing you do when you load up a value? You're going to use it in arithmetic. It would be much more sensible to, instead of uh, defining FLI, to instead define an FMAC where one or two of the input values could come from that predefined set of values. Having done this on another architecture, it's about 5 to 10 percent across the board. It is a fantastic capability. So I would love to see uh, somebody uh, do that as, as an, uh, you know, ZFA version two or whatever. Um, I don't know if we have enough encoding space for it. I have not looked at that problem. All right, so uh, any questions? Nope. Then uh, I'll, I'll just thank, you know, as I mentioned before, there are a ton of contributors here from a number of different companies. I think I got everybody except for Intel. I'm sorry if there's anybody from Intel in here. You, your name was supposed to be up there. Um, I'll be available at the Ventana booth if anyone wants to go into more depth on any of this stuff or anything that I you know, did not cover that you wanted to hear about. So that's it. <laughs>